Yeah. Yeah. Well, you see that in the wilderness stories too. Yeah. Where you got you free, you're headed to a promised land and they said, more cucumbers and the leeks and the soup. And, right? yeah. yeah. It's like, don't poke the bear. Yes. <laughs> you want to hold the wolf by the ears because if you let go. Yeah. Um, okay. How old was uh, Moses and Aaron? 80 and 83. Any of you 80 or 83 yet? <laughs> See? You, you're still active. <laughs> you know how to roll the call to speak to the power. <laughs> 80 and 83? That's pretty good. Okay. okay. Now we're going to do another story. And this is this is the one. This is the one with the green circle. And it's like I have been in one. In seminary, you have to read a hundred thousand books, a thousand pages a year. But two of the books you had to read are in the Bible. Thank you. And the Book of Concord. Thank you. I love them both of them. But when I read this part in First Kings, uh, I was just blown away. Uh, my background, I tell folks, and I'm not one of the, the Kids, I got to go to a church school. I went to the university, and my undergraduate degree was social work. I knew I wanted to be a pastor probably since my third tenth grade, um, but I really didn't have a guide helping me go that way. Right, so I went to the university of Minnesota and became a social worker. I had one philosophy one hundred and one class, and no theology classes, no Bible classes. Uh, and I have one religion class called the Sociology of Religion, which I dealt with the 1920s and 30s. The social gospel movement that said uh, our faith isn't important unless we're living it, right? Uh, they kind of thought they were going to bring heaven to earth, and it didn't quite work out that way. But that's what's shaping. And then I get this Bible passage in First Kings from Micaiah ben Yomot, and I thought, this is what's going to direct my ministry, if not my actions, at least my thinking and talk, speaking truth to power, just simply telling the truth, um, telling the truth about Bible stories, telling the truth about our doubts and fears, just being truthful. So, um, you want it? it? It's on both sides. Do you want a reader or do you want me just to tell you about it? Tell us. Oh, you like stories? Yeah. Do you want do you want some waters? <laughs> yes. Okay. So I'm, I'm gonna have you look on page three of that handbook. Where it says the modern version I have been in my story. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm going to tell the story, and when I say King Ahab, you can think King Ahab, or you can think President George W. Bush. When I talk about uh, King Jehoshaphat, I want you to think of either Jehoshaphat or David Blair, uh, Prime Minister David Blair. Right? Wasn't he the one in England at the time? Yeah. 
And the war against Aaron is the war in Iraq, right? And uh, I find this just yeah. fascinating. Zedekiah of Chenay, <laughs> also <laughs> as Dick of Cheney, right? <laughs> and that's how my ear here. So, so now what you do is you imagine the story as a three act play. Oh, your eyes can read while your ears listen. That's okay. Um, so act one on the stage is King Ahab. And he's kind of wandering around thinking to himself, um, yeah, you know that that land over there, that should belong to us. Um, I should go to war and take it. Um, I'm the king of Israel. That's the northern kingdom. How about if I get the king from the southern kingdom, England, uh, to come in, and we'll talk about going to war. So Jehoshaphat comes in, and uh, Jehoshaphat Blair says to Bush, "Your war is my war. You know, we're part of NATO. We'll support you. Um, go for it." But but he says. We should, we should ask the Lord for some guidance. You got any resources that way? And Ahab says, yeah, I got 400 prophets, right? All come in. They say, so do we go to war? Is that what God wants? And all 400 prophets say, go for it, go for it. And Jehoshaphat goes, well, that's nice. Uh, you got anybody else here that, uh, Maybe he has a different opinion. And King Ahab says, Yeah, I got this damn SOB named Micaiah Ben Hamar. And that guy never, ever tells me anything good. So that's this one. You think we can get him? That's the end of Act One. And Ahab says, uh, Let's send a messenger and find Micaiah Ben Hamar. You tell him to get his buddy. So, scene two. Two kings are there. The 400 prophets are lined up behind them, right? They're sitting, the kings are sitting on their thrones out in public at the gate. And it's a powerful moment. And, and Micaiah is going to become. But the messenger who went to find Micaiah says, hey, Micaiah, this is the program. We're going to war. 400 puppets say, go for it. You just, you got to give up the program, right? So when you come in, say the same thing. And Makai says, well, tell you the truth, I'm going to tell whatever God gives me to do. And Makai comes in. Kings are there. 400 puppets are there. And the king says, so what's the word? And Makai goes, go to war. Yeah, yeah, bah, bah. God bless Israel, right? Make Israel great again. Oh. And, <laughs> and the king says, You will as only. You never tell me the truth. Right? And he's upset. And he says, I'm going to listen to the other guys. And what I want you to do with Micaiah is you take him and you put him in jail and you feed him a reduced diet of bread and water and you keep him there until I come back. Right? Because Micaiah finally tells the truth and he says, well, the word of the Lord that I have is if you guys go to war, it's devastation. Um, I can see bodies all over the hillside. You're not going to win. And Ahab, you're not going to come back blind, which really angers Ahab. Hence, the uh, throw him in jail and feed him on a half ration of bread and water. And you keep him there until I come back in victory. Right? Okay, that's act two. Act three Ahab and Jehoshaphat put their armies together. They're going off the war. And Ahab goes, man, let's see. This could be risky. I know what Makai said. I tell you what, Jehoshaphat. Yeah. I'm going to dress like a soldier, but you dress like a king. Right? And we'll go to war, 
not just be like a soldier, like one of the guys, and you'll be the king in the chariot. War starts. The king of Aaron says, you know, the select group of Navy SEALs or Marines, he says, um, you fight only against the king of Israel. That's your job. Take him out. And uh, they see the king in all of his robes in his chariot. They go after him. When they get there, they go, oh, wait a minute, we got the long guy. That's a Joseph. Um, and then it says, they pull back from it. And then it says, uh, a soldier shot an arrow in the air. Where it landed, he knew not. And it stuck in King Ahab, right between his breastplate and whatever. And he dies, right? Um, part of the end of the story. They take, they take the king's body back. And they start washing up the chariot in the public square, and the dogs look up the blood. And it says, and the prostitutes come and bathe in the blood. I don't know what that's about. <laughs> Maybe that's color to the story. <laughs> Powerful story, I think. Um, and it, it, I know it's not about the Gulf War, but it just sort of fits that way. One king wants to go to war, looking for an excuse, get somebody else in to be supportive. They go off this coalition or willing, whatever, and they fight this war. Um, and and it's a it's a tragedy. I mean it's just a tragedy all the way through. Um, and there's a point I'm trying to remember in here. Um, <laughs> you know Zedekiah at one point makes these horns and he pushes against Micaiah, you know, like I'm gonna push you out of here. And then when did God's spirit move from me to have, to have asked her to you, right? And uh, pretty upset. That's not the point. The point is, I think in this modern version of Bush and Blair and Iraq and, uh, uh, and all that, I think the Micaiah person was president H. George Bush, the dad, in that uh, first desert Middle East fight where they went in to save Kuwait. Uh, and H. George got into trouble with his military leaders because he didn't push off into his land and he let, uh, um, who was the dictator? Saddam Hussein. And, and uh, President uh, H. George. Said so the reason why is if we go in, I see bodies on the hillside and defeat everywhere, and it's not going to work. And we're going to go into a quagmire that lasts decades. Well, Sunny Boy George W. and his friend Zedekiah of the Shenandoah decided uh, to ignore that point in, and it's the same thing that happened in the story. So it's a stretch. And, but, but it's kind of real, right? What happens? Mm -hmm. Speaking truth to power. Now, you want some time to talk together. I have one more story about uh, David and Bathsheba and Nathan, but you probably want some time. So, uh, any responses today? Speaking truth to power um, for Moses and the people? They suffered along with the Egyptians, but finally, 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 it happened. Um, the folks that we made slaves in this country suffered and suffered and suffered. Finally, it's happening. The big change, but not really. Um, oh, these are the kind of big stories, right? Turn your page over and look at those questions. Uh, you can use these to start some discussion. The idea of this site is to say, or at least get to where in your life have you felt called, felt the truth when it was unhappy? Um, it could be as a high school student where you point out a teacher or principal that's not acting well. It could be at work where you got a, a boss or a manager or somebody over you that um, is kind of screwing things up and, and causing difficulty. Somebody has to address it. Uh, and again, maybe, maybe it's the uh, 
the crazy uncle you have that thinks you're crazy um, because you, you differ so deeply, but you feel you need to speak your truth to his power. Right? Um, what, what kinds of stories can you tell each other? Right? And then you do that for a while and maybe we'll ask you to pick one out and share it. And then if we have time, um, probably the most famous, other than other than Moses to Pharaoh, the most famous truth of power is Nathan to David and that whole story. And that's pretty interesting too. I could tell it in a way that maybe opened your eyes. So go for it. Then I'll drink my coffee. If you have questions, you You can use the questions to fill out or you can share your own story. Yep. That is true. Uh, I, I think yeah. something because um, the family is just out of the I've done just a minute. Small, so. Why I don't have any part in both of them. Guys, just a minute. We got a question. Oh, sorry. 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 Wait. Can I do for you? Yes. Yeah. So yeah. when you're talking to us, did I miss something? No, no, that's not a question. What is true? Right? <laughs> and uh, you have one truth and I have another truth, or at least we believe we have the truth, but we differ, right? Uh, that happens, Marty. I think your sermon several weeks ago spoke to that beautifully and boldly, <laughs> that if it doesn't match the Lord's words. Yeah. I thought it's such an incredible, bold sermon without being political, but it was political. So, so maybe that's part of the answer, that, that if the truth you're holding on to, because it's meaningful to you, and it's what you believe sincerely, if it doesn't manage uh, God's compassion for one another, um, maybe, maybe it's not the whole truth, right? Um, for instance, uh, I wrote this pastor's page that talks about immigrants in the newsletter this month. With the, you know, millions of people coming to the border. What do we do? Well, as Christians, this doesn't solve the issue. My wife said that. Well, I mean, you raised the issue, but you didn't give any solutions. <laughs> and I said, yeah, I'm not. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what, what, for instance, what the Bible says about aliens, uh, people who come into your country, right? Um, the way you treat them is you treat them as if they are full citizens with you, right? All the rights you have, that's what they have. All the benefits you think you deserve, that's what you try for them. So that's a, a biblical truth. It doesn't solve the immigration at the border and all that. Right? But another person's truth might be their vermin, their rapists, their whatever. Well, there's probably some criminals in the box. There is. I mean, I would say, like most. But then you sort out what's the truth. Uh, and it's, it's not Republican or Democrat. It's, uh, it's what, what fits with the gospel. What fits with the biblical witness and and hate and division and name calling and vitriol and division? That's not what fits with scripture. So uh, a whole lot of people believe that's the truth, but as Christians we have to say, but it's not that's true. Okay. Now talk to one yourselves or interrupt, and I'll keep talking. <laughs> oh, well, that's the best one. Um, go ahead. I got this one. I'm going to go ahead. 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 I'm Name calling. So, open the social media. I thought in the Bible, the Bible gives some of the gifts. And the gifts, you know, I remember from that. So, I'm not going to be able to do this. But, I'm not going to be able to do this. Not just in free class media, right? Yes. What you should have to be in all the associated with that. 
I was the million I don't know the answer. What can we do if you get another five minutes to that, give everybody a chance to say what they want to say, and we'll come back together. Just so Okay, so you guys do the you know, 
I mean, ever since you're selling this, I have I have to do so I have a question. We have a press now. He was designing it around. He was a doctor. He's not But he had a better rabbit in the game. when you are ready to talk as a large group, there's somebody from your table to raise your hand. Right. Yeah, right. Um, um, I don't know I don't know I don't know I I and now I don't think you're going to change I think I should have said, you're wrong. Everyone this table is ready to be clear. I know it. Everybody else are ready? Yeah, are we missing a ball game? Oh, 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 Stop him, and he didn't let in strong refusals. Stop him either. I'm going back, back, until God accomplished what God intended. Um, 400 to 1, odds, right? Standing before the two powerful kings, and he tells the truth. And we don't know uh, what happened to him because he was to be kept jailed on a half ration. Until the king back, king came back in victory, and the king didn't come back. He still didn't have the victory. So powerful, you know this this one guy standing up to four hundred people and facing the consequence. Right? Um, I thought for sure they were going to arrest Stephen Colbert afterwards and haul him off to Montana or something. But his his talk was really really strong, and uh, I admire Bush. For taking it. I mean, he, he paid attention to things. Um, but how about you? This this table first. What what do you know about speaking truth of power? Okay. So my my thought was a little bit on the organizational side because such we're we're doing such big things here. Oh, and our topic was oh we talk a little about inspiration. 
Okay, so uh, my my thought was nothing new. I've been in Lincoln Women Voters for over 40 years and they're divided in, we have different levels. We have local leagues, state, national, and you deal with your own, what your own things are. Okay, so if you take uh, an issue like immigration, which is overwhelming and I mean, at this point, really overwhelming. If you divide it into what you can do locally, statewide, nationally, and internationally, then maybe you can we can find a way to make a make a dent. Okay, the dent is Ronnie's idea. Okay, so so I'm. <laughs> Oh, make that dance. Okay. So, so since um, the thing we know the most about is acting individually and as a group in our church, we, we, we thought that that would be a good way to start. And in our conversation, um, Sherry said that we already have an international um, uh, what is sister, it? sister city. So we were thinking sister, that synod. sister synod. So what we were trying to think yeah. of is how can we deliver help on an individual basis to a group that's working along the border in a positive way because we can't imagine how if someone is interested in doing this last year they had a hundred and now they have ten thousand people coming to them for help they must just feel like oh what you know our resources are spent now i only have enough money to you know to go on half rations or so mm -hmm. and and so and carol mentioned the fact that there's a um, Place where there's a thousand children who whose situation has not been re resolved in a number of years, and so it's kind of ground to a halt. So our idea was that we would contact the synod and find out if we can find a sister synod that's somewhere along the border in Texas or Arizona, and um, come to some sort of a, a group consensus, find out what they're what they need, and act through that. Um, the groups that we already are acquainted with working with and that have similar um, uh, focus that we same thing that we feel that the Christian action has to be. And also, if people are saying negative things about immigrants, we're going to be very, very um, brash and just tell them that they are not telling the truth. Amen. Amen. So we can't do everything, but we can do something. What's the yeah. something we can do? It's that. And then a little joke about how do you eat an elephant? Yeah, one bite at a time. Right at a time. Yeah. <laughs> my, uh, one of my confirmation girls from Colorado is now a bishop's associate in Colorado. And she spent a big chunk of her ministry down in El Paso, right on the border. Yeah. I mean, there, there are ways to, to make some connections there. Good. Thank you for that. Anybody else want to share? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 Um, all the examples we've talked about and that you provided us are individual speaking power, someone in authority right, as a government or mm -hmm. political situation. Um, I think we could also do that at a much lower lower scale. Yeah. One to one. And the example I shared was uh, I was on the architectural review board at a university, and the architects had designed a, a building that would not work for disabled people. And this was the day after the 2016 election. And I was thinking about uh, our newly elected president making fun of disabled people. And, and here are these architects designing a, a building that would not work for disabled people. So I decided, okay, this is what is, I'll probably get fired for this, but I pushed back on it and said, this is unacceptable because the law says you have to integrate them on every floor of the building and not just in one little corner on the ground floor. And the uh, the other people at the table were all either deans or president or provosts. <laughs> and I was there because I was a professor. And uh, um, I, I pushed back pretty hard on it. And the president said, you know, he has a point. <laughs> but they didn't change it. Well, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the examples I use are sort of on the high scale. 
the way most of us live our lives, we do things on a smaller scale, bit by bit, things like that. Yeah. Anybody else? Or needs to share? Yeah, go ahead. I'll just mention that um, we wrestled with Judy's question yeah. about what is truth and how uh, to speak truth to power uh, would indicate that you're sure you're right. And the, the uh, uh, situation that we struggle with is the Israeli Gaza situation. And so what is right? Um, and there are people who feel strongly on one uh, argument and strongly on the other. And how sometimes our ethics are muddied by um, by the situation and it's really not clear. Jimmy, I think your question really goes to the heart of men. Um, and maybe when we are speaking our truth, we ought to be a little humble about it, saying, This is how I see it, this is how I believe. Not saying this is the truth, then you're wrong. But as Christians, we're supposed to not argue politics or yeah. religion. Or yeah. You can discuss it, but yeah. sometimes you can't. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. And I was part of a um, decision making process when I worked in a high school. A consensus decision making was very powerful. Because if you could find your voice and if you could find what you thought was the truth, we saw in committees, they would take a vote on something and nine people were against something and one person stood up and they spoke and they made an argument. It wasn't angry, it wasn't accusatory. They stood up and spoke a truth that was their own and they influenced the nine. Yeah. And I think we have to keep that in front of us. We seem discouraged now because we don't think we can influence. But if we approach something and say, I can, I'm going to try. I'm going to, I'm a small, I'm a still small voice crying in the wilderness, but yeah. make way for the Lord. Yeah. Well, if you think of a number of things uh, that were changed incrementally, um, you'll never get rid of cigarettes. Yeah. Well, all of a sudden, you can't even find an advertisement. Right? You can still smoke, but, but there was a painful net change. Uh, the drunk drivers, oh, mothers against drunk drivers, and then tremendous in the way of teaching about that. There's, there's small ways that uh, break by break and break. Um, and, uh, yeah, Laura. So that reminds me, President Kennedy, right after the Bay of Pigs, he realized that he was surrounded by a bunch of yes men that were going to tell him what he thought. And he, 400 profits. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so it was my stake and my guards is what the terms come out to be. But he said, I always want someone in the room that will challenge me if I am wrong. So he always had someone in his room in a decision making process that would go against the crowd and say, This is not the truth. This won't work. Let's look at it another way. And that's, they're doing that more, but that's the mind thing the mind part. Yeah, my person was named Bill. <laughs> 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 Good. Well, we could, we could take time to talk about David and Bathsheba, or we can say there's a great basketball game. Let's get back. Great basketball game. A great basketball game. Let's beat the power. That's true. Good. Good. And like one more week to run Sunday after that. Thank you. One of the things that's really frustrating about the immigration story is, you know, I've read it 